Okay, welcome to the December webinar of the NASA Night Sky Network. This month, we welcome Robert Nemiroff to our webinar, who will share with us highlights from the astronomy picture of the day for 2019. Dr. Nemiroff is a professor of physics at Michigan Tech. He worked at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland before going to Michigan Tech. He's perhaps best known scientifically for papers predicting with colleagues, microlensing phenomena, and showing the gamma ray bursts were consistent with occurring at cosmological distances. He also led a group that developed and deployed the first online fisheye night sky monitor at a variety of major astronomical observatories around the world. His current research interests include trying to limit the attributes of our universe with distant gamma ray bursts and investigating the use of relativistic illumination fronts to orient astronomical nebulae. I think that there's probably some of you out there that uh, understand that a whole lot more than I do. But what Dr. Nemiroff is best known for is with his co-founder, Jerry Bonnell, of creating the astronomy picture of the day, which they continue to edit. Please welcome Robert Nemiroff. Thank you. Um, so I'm sort of new to this technology. I should share my screen, right? Yes. Okay. Working on that. Here we go. So now I will play from start. Okay, here we are. Good. Yeah, it looks great. All right, now I'm going to move something so I can see the Quest q and at the rear end. Okay, and I went past. Oh no, so. All right, so still trying. Here we go. Yeah. Dave okay, and so I can monitor the. Dave and I can monitor the Q&A for you and uh, so that you don't have to pay attention to it and then we can um, bring something up. So. Okay, nice. I see we have a question, but I'll, I'll start off. Uh, thanks for having me on the Night Sky Network. This is, a, this is an honor. Uh, so I'll be reviewing this past year of astronomy pictures of the day. Um, so I do this, uh, I'm one of the two people who write and edit the astronomy picture of the day with my colleague, Jerry Bunnell, who's at uh, University of Maryland, but stationed at Goddard Space Flight Center. I'm in Michigan Technological University, which is in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And so some of you may have heard of APOD, but, uh, but uh, to find it, it's not hard. You just go to apod.nasa.gov. And we started this back in 1995, which means that we're coming up on our 25th year anniversary, which makes us one of the older, continuously running websites of any category. Uh, so what we do is pretty simple. Their name is what we do. We put out a new image uh, every day. Sometimes it's a repeat on weekends, but it's, a, it's new for a while and usually completely new. And then we describe it in just a paragraph. And this paragraph sometimes usually has many hyperlinks that goes deeper into a topic than many people want to go. But if you don't want to go that far, you don't even have to read the text. You can just read the opening lines or go as far as you want. So. Um, at this point, we've uh, put on APOD most of the, the classic images of astronomy of recent years. So if you remember, like, oh, wasn't there this great image? We're pretty sure to have it. So you can just go to apod.nasa.gov, go click on a little search, type in something that you might remember, and we probably have it with a really convenient explanation. So let me get to... Uh, this past year, but I'll be backing up into the year before, into 2018 a bit, with, uh, into November. So uh, I'll start off with a, a video. So I have both videos and, um, and still pictures. Um, so this is uh, asteroid Bennu, which was visited, is still being visited by Osiris X and NASA mission. And so it took lots of images and you can, this video, you can see it, there's no audio here. You can see it choppily move around, and that didn't work. Okay, there we go. So this is a, uh, this is a big rock that's, uh, to consult my notes, what you're seeing, it's uh, about 500 meters across, um, and you're seeing about a four and a quarter hour rotation condensed into a few seconds, seven seconds. So this is an Earth crossing asteroid. So someday in the future, theoretically, this might hit the Earth, won't destroy the Earth, if it hits near a city, it could be a problem. If it hits near uh, some place where it could cause tsunamis, it could be a problem. 
Uh, but we don't know its complete orbit. We don't think it's on a direct orbit anytime in the near future, but there are several effects that will be coming pretty near the Earth soon. And so the effect of the Earth on its orbit in the future isn't all that well known. So many hundreds or thousands of years from now, this could, well, could become part of Earth. And uh, so there's a, uh, OSIRIS-REx is going to be taking a sample of this asteroid and sending it back to Earth, and that will land here on Earth in 2023. So that's something we can look forward to next year in 2020, uh, it, uh, it going down there. Uh, okay. So in this past, a little more than a year ago, uh, there was some, something unexpected, that there was um, a discovery of the first interstellar asteroid. So pretty much well, all the comets and all the asteroids that we've ever seen coming around the sun, they've all been from our solar system, so far as we could tell. Uh, but uh, suddenly there was one that was called Oumuamua, and this, is, uh, this was highly hyperbolic, which meant that it was, this orbit was clearly not something that our sun could contain. And it was on a very unusual orbit, and it was coming actually close to the Earth and close to the sun, which was very exciting. Uh, then it did something even more unexpected. It went on, and I'll show you the video here, clicking on it. It went on an unusual orbit. Okay, still having, here we go. So here you see the, in the inner parts of the solar system here, the Earth's going around. Here comes uh, the interstellar asteroid and it's coming out. And then it does something even more unusual and that it has a slightly unexpected tra trajectory. So if it was perfectly round and not outgassing, it would have been on the blue trajectory, but it, it differed from that, which was unexpected. So we don't usually see that. Um, probably it was outgassing, uh, but there's, it's certainly an unusual object. So as we'll see later, there's actually the second interstellar, this one's clearly a comet, came into our solar system that we see. Now these things are coming into our solar system all the time. It's just that with modern computerized telescope technology, we're able to identify them. We're looking at more of the sky. Computers are looking at more of the sky more often than ever before. And so we can pick out these unusual things like interstellar asteroids and interstellar comets. Okay, so here we have a video that's got audio. So this is a video we featured on APOD. As you see at the top, this is when it was featured. So anything I'm saying here, you can just go back and you can read about it, you can watch the video, you can see the image uh, on the day set, stay pod on November 26, 2018. So this video will run one minute and 36 seconds. And here's who it's attributed for. So what we're seeing here is uh, looking down from the International Space Station. And the International Space Station during this video will see something a little bit unusual. It will see a rocket launch that is bound for the space station. So put your seatbelts on and here we go. You should hear music in the background. So here's the rocket launch. It's Progress MS-10 launch. You can see lots of city lights. You can see the Earth's atmosphere as a gold band. More city lights. This is a time lapse. You can see the uh, plume from the rocket. You can see clouds. You can see city lights illuminating the clouds. I find this very beautiful. You can see a uh, core stage re-entry here. It'll flare in a second. There it goes. Really. And now the rest of it will slowly approach the space station and give needed supplies. It's getting darker on the Earth, but you can still see the city lights. So you can go back and keep watching this until the friends and neighbors complain by going to the November 26, 2018 April. Here you see major cities. And of course, we don't make our videos, usually. Uh, but we usually find out where they came from, or we wouldn't, or we would, we would definitely tell you so this was a astronaut a cast. Okay. Oh, okay. Spiraling supermassive black holes. This is a big year um, for 
spiraling black holes in the universe. So there are black holes around the universe. And the LIGO is missions that, they're not missions, they're ground stations in the US and now one in Europe uh, that are able to see gravitational radiation. And what the most common type of thing that is seen is two spiraling supermassive black holes, unusually massive from what we thought they would be. So here's a video replaying that. Um, so here you see the two, uh, two black holes going around each other. There's, the reason why they're not completely dark is because there's gas around them. And so now we go to a top view. And if two black holes spiral in with gas around them, there might be a signature that you could see in optical light with maybe the Hubble Space Telescope, or maybe in the future with the James Webb Space Telescope, or one of the large ground-based telescopes. So there's, here, let me turn up Hall of the Mountain King here. So the two black dots are the, uh, are the black holes and the gas is shown. This is not a real video, this is a simulation, computer simulation, because we want to know what happens, because we, we want to know what to look for. Maybe there'll be a lot of, um, a lot of light, the simulations say, so we look at one way. This has a lot of high energy light, but not so much. And a lot of these spiraling black holes that we're picking up at LIGO are too far away to see this. So here we see gravitational lens effects where when one black hole moves in front of the other, you don't see it really block it. You see it pull an image around the whole, whole side of it, sometimes all sides. Now this, this spiraling is well before they come together. When they come together, they go around really fast, many times a second, and then they merge in a flashing gravitational radiation. So this, this doesn't go that far. Okay, just love that stuff. Okay, this is a static picture. You won't see these bubbles move, but the bubbles they are. So what kind of bubbles are they, you might ask? Thanks for almost asking, although I couldn't hear you. Nobody asked in the chat window either, but that's okay. I know you're asking inside. So these are bubbles of methane, and they're in Russia, Lake Baikal. So Lake Baikal is unusually clear. It's the largest by volume freshwater lake in the world. And it's sitting on top of methane deposits. Around it are methane deposits too. So in the winter, the, the clear ice freezes. Much of it is clear, and you can see the methane bubbles bubble up which is really cool to see. It's also a little bit ominous because we're worried now about global warming. And although the most talked about global warming gas is carbon dioxide, methane is even more effective at global warming. So we don't know if there's enough methane below Lake Baikal or in the surrounding area to significantly affect global warming. We don't know, but it's something to think about. Robert, I have a question for you, and, and um, this kind of relates to one that uh, showed up in the Q&A. Um, so far, and then this one is, is similar, most of the, uh, all the videos you have have been credited to NASA, but then you have this one at Lake Bacall, which is, uh, has a copyright for a, I guess, a private citizen. Yes. So it's not only NASA, even though it's a NASA site, not only NASA, uh, can put things on, and people can submit their their things. And so the person asked where they were wondering, how do you go about submitting photos to APOD this way? Okay, good question. So yes, so we try to get the best astronomy images, whether they're taken by NASA or not. Um, so many times people are in the right place at the right time. They capture meteor showers. A lot of people may be involved with uh, the Night Sky Network. I've taken some really great images, and we've run images from that. And that just 
that NASA doesn't have or no one has. So if we see a really great image, we'll ask permission to use it. And once we grant permission, we'll run it. We do, however, reject many more than we get. So when we're, we're able to run. So we get, I used to, I'm used to saying we get 10 for every one, we get submitted 10 images for every one we're able to run. But for some reason in the past year, that's gone up to close to 20, maybe even more than 20 now. So for some reason, the submissions have increased. I think because lots of people are getting fancier equipment and able to take better images, which is good for us because we're able to feature better images. But it makes it more competitive because more people have the better equipment. So that's a, a really good question. So yeah, if you have a great image, we can't guarantee we're gonna put it on, but please send it to us because we wanna see it. It doesn't always have to be just great in terms of visual. It can also be very educational. We're interested in effects that haven't been seen before or something that can really help demonstrate some point. Because APOD is not only just about popularity, although popularity is important to us. One idea is to show a really cool image and the really cool image is a hook. And people say, wow, what's going on there? And that curiosity that people have is the hook that we can then, they can read into our explanation and learn more about stuff. So a good image is also um, an entryway to more information. But sometimes, as we'll see in some of these images I'm showing, they're not all super clear, uh, but um, they're all chosen for a, usually a pretty good reason. Uh, one of the things that we go by is that if we see an image, do we think, well, if we had to pick just one astronomy, one astronomy image that characterized this day in astronomy, would it be this one? And there's rarely just one answer, but sometimes we say, yeah, this one sort of is the best one. Uh, and so we'll go with that. And sometimes there's a few days delay. So anyway, thank you. Really cool question. So here's another video that was submitted well before, uh, well actually I was born already, but uh, before APOD got started in 1995. So this is a reconstruction of um, Earthrise. So in, um, let's see, 50 years ago, uh, December, so that's actually 51 years ago almost now, uh, Apollo 8 uh, circled the moon with people on it, the first people pod to circle the moon, and uh, they surprisingly saw um, the moon rise. And so this has now been digitally reconstructed. There are three good images taken, uh, and uh, it's been reconstructed into a video of what it would look like to see that first Earth rise from orbiting around the moon. So at the bottom, you see the moon, and here we go. This is a C major prelude by Johann Sebastian Bach. For it. Looks like the moon. What's that? At this point, uh, one of the astronauts said, Oh my God, look at that picture over there. Here's the Earth coming up. And this is what he saw. And it is one of the most iconic images of all time. But this is the video he saw. I mean, he didn't see video. This is what he saw. This is real time. He's seeing this in real time out of the module, the Apollo 8 window. The moon is not really colorful, but the Earth is, which adds to the amazement of this. Everyone you know is on that big blue orbit. Everyone. The rise of the Earth is caused by Apollo 8 going around the moon. The moon's been called a magnificent desolation because it's sort of brownish gray, which I think is well captured by the colors here. Earth is many colors, including bright blue. So we pair the music to the video. The video didn't come with this music. So 
we at APOD play different th musical things and see which one works the best. And this one worked the best for that. So the next picture you know, is, We uh, actually uh, had uh, Ernie Wright, um, mm -hmm. who uh, was the, uh, did the animation on that. He oh. actually did a webinar for us, I think it was last spring. Okay. And so we'll see if we can scare up the, uh, the link so that people can go find that. Okay. Well, if you go to that APOD, that should have links to it too, I'm pretty sure. Okay, so this is uh, the, f the one of the first time that uh, the landers saw the um, Earth coming up over the lunar limb. Now, this the first image was actually in black and white. Later image was in color. So this has been digitally remastered to have all the high resolution of the Hasselblad and the color of the color image together. And this was produced by Jim Weigat. Right. Photo is taken by Bill Anders from Apollo 8. Uh, Time Magazine had this image, a similar one, as the uh, image of the century for last century. OK, so this is the famous Orion Nebula. So this is something familiar, seen a little bit differently. This is an infrared from the WISE mission. OK, uh, rather than Go on, let's, we can gawk at that. You can go back and read more about it. I'll jump to the next one. So here's a meteor shower uh, and a comet here. That comet is Vertanen, I think. Um, yes, Comet Vertanen. And uh, this is the famous Pleiades, as people from the Night Sky Network would know. Here's the Hyades, and here's a meteor shower, and here's the red of a nebula all together taken by J.C. Casada, just a beautiful image that showed a lot. So we were very happy to run this image. It's taken over the past year. Okay, so the moon uh, gets struck with stuff. It's hard to notice because the moon's usually pretty bright and people don't usually look at it all that often. I mean, you look at it, but you don't really see it in high resolution, but with modern video techniques and with uh, being able to, to look at the moon during total lunar eclipses um, and looking, taking videos of the part of the moon when it's dark, uh, there's more and more meteoroids found hitting the moon. Now this one was caught by many people because it occurred during a total lunar eclipse last year. So I actually had a graduate student become very interested in this and APOD was actually of use to the science of this because we had a lot of images sent to us at APOD of the, the impact, the meteor impact uh, of the moon from many different places. So it can be well, the moon can be triangulated against the background and, and things can be done a little bit more scientifically with all of these things together. So this all happened in the past year. Happy to be part of that. Okay, so, ooh. Keeps going past that. So this is a um, spiral galaxy D100, and it's seen in an unusual way because there's a big red tail from it. So in clusters of galaxies and groups of galaxies, uh, there is an intergalactic medium, and this intergalactic medium can cause gas to be stripped out of galaxies. So here's a spiral galaxy that had a lot of gas stripped out of it as it went. Uh, so D99 is down here, and this already has had a lot of the gas stripped out of it. So this was taken by Hubble, and just one of the interesting images uh, you know, that shows something that hadn't really been seen well before uh, this past year. So this past January this came in. Okay, so in the very first of 2019, which we're wrapping up now, uh, the New Horizons satellite went past something else besides Pluto, which it did several years before. It went past what was then called Ultima Thule, that now has a new name. And actually, I'm blanking on the name. Does anybody know the name? Um, so please type it in your, your question and answer, because I'm blanking on the name right now. Um, so this was a very unusual asteroid, first of all, because it's far out in the solar system. And asteroids far in the solar system are different are thought to be different than near and by in the solar system. And indeed it was. It seems to be there are these two lobes that just happen to spiral in and connect. And so this is a clearly two-lobed asteroid. And a lot of this material is thought to be from the early solar system. OK, 
Okay. So during this past year, um, Juno continues to it, in its elliptical orbits around Jupiter. And so every time it takes many images. So this is the 16th time past Jupiter in its 53 day orbit. And so it took um, 21 images and it was made by amateurs, uh, very sophisticated amateurs who work hard on this into a video of what it looks like to go past Jupiter. And so we paired this with Holst, the planets, and you'll never guess which planet we paired it with, Jupiter. Jupiter. So here we go. Music played by the United States Air Force Heritage of America Band from the Wikipedia. It only runs 54 seconds. So the clouds of Jupiter are complex, a lot of storm systems. So we're coming up on something called the dolphin cloud. Which looks like a dolphin right here. Got a lot of notoriety. And so Juno has zipped past Jupiter again, trying to determine what the interior of Jupiter is like. How solid, how liquid it is. Determine the magnetic fields of Jupiter, the gravitational field of Jupiter, the interior of Jupiter, and the cloud patterns of Jupiter. And it's doing very well. Okay, cool. Okay, so we have, um, we had two um, rovers uh, rolling around Mars, and then in 2018, one of them died, but we didn't give up on it until 2019. So this is one of the last shots from the Opportunity rover at Perseverance Valley. So the Opportunity rover actually went uh, for 15 years and it was supposed to go for 90 days. So it covered a lot. It helped uncover some of the unknown wet past of Mars. And so here you can see a Martian landscape and a Martian sky. Uh, and you can see part of the, uh, the rover at the bottom. So we said goodbye to opportunity, but curiosity is still rolling around. And this next year, we're gonna get another one. We're gonna Mars 2020 rover uh, on Mars. That'll be sort of like curiosity, which is like a small car. Okay, we continue to learn about our universe. So one of the ways we learn about a universe is by running computer simulations again. So here's the computer simulation starting with the early universe, and you're going to see on the, on a, with the simulation a cluster of galaxies form. And so this one, although I thought it was corny at first, I think it works, tell me if you think it works. This is um, mated with um, Beethoven's Fifth. It has just the kind of violence that occurs in the time lapse. I won't talk over it that much. Okay, a little bit. You're seeing the, the colors are the fast moving gas. Uh, the brighter it is, the faster moving the gas is. On the upper left, it says 200 kiloparsecs, which is like 600 light years. This is the redshift. How, this is how far it is. Z equals 0.31. We're getting closer and closer to the current time, which is Z equals zero. Look at these gas clouds crashing into each other. Okay, my eye is usually drawn to the big gas cloud at the bottom, but there's another one now coming in the top. And then I'm going to snap my fingers, and we're going to go into optical light as simulated. And you're going to see the galaxies and the streams of stars from these galaxies. These two groups of galaxies are going to come together and form a huge cluster, which is very similar to what we see out in the universe. A lot of this is dark matter that, that dominates the gravity of these clusters. Yes, yeah, it's Aroka, thank you. That's the name. Joseph Chuck to actually know who he is. Uh, told me the name of Bob. Okay, so 
we try to figure out what the universe was like, what the universe is made out of even. We're not even 100% sure what the universe is made out of. It's made out of this weird stuff. We think some of it is dark energy, some of it is dark matter. But we start the universe off with simulations with these dark matter and dark energy. And we see if we get something that comes out to what we look like we see in the universe now. And that looks a lot like the universe now, which is one of the reasons why we think the universe is mostly dark energy, a lot of dark matter, and relatively little of matter like we, like us and the Earth. Okay, this past year, we've been in a pretty deep solar minimum. So I'll, you'll see this several times in the slideshow. This was taken in 2012, uh, the image of the sun on the left. And you can see during solar maximum, there's a lot of activity on the sun. Uh, there's, uh, these are essentially sunspot active regions. There's, uh, but over here, uh, last year, not so much. And there's been months have gone by. In fact, February, February went by without a recorded sunspot, which is unusual. And 2019, I think, has the fewest sunspots on record. Okay, we kept peering into the uh, distant universe. I think this is uh, Hubble again. So this is a Bell 370, one of the first known galaxy cluster gravitational lenses. So if you remember that video, that was a cluster of galaxies. So that cluster of galaxies can be in front of something behind it, galaxies in the universe behind it. And those galaxies in the distant universe, they are gravitationally lensed. They're not affected. They don't know what's happening between us and them. But their images are, are, are stretched into these arcs. And they, look at this galaxy. It's just totally stretched out. And so from looking at these stretched out distant galaxies, we can learn a lot. We can learn a lot about how the mass is distributed in the foreground cluster of galaxies, which is one of the reasons why we're pretty sure clusters of galaxies have so much dark matter. in them. Because if it was all the mass is concentrated in just the galaxies you see, you wouldn't get smooth arcs like this. Oops, went backwards. Didn't mean to. OK, uh, if I can go forwards here. OK. Oh, even more forwards. Oh, Azor. Okay. I didn't even know this was in the offing until I saw the images and I couldn't believe the images. So this is Azor. This was some sounding rockets launched by NASA in northern Norway. And the idea is to study the upper atmosphere. So these sounding rockets released gas, specific kinds of gas. And I'll look at my notes. It's trimethyl aluminum. I'm sure you probably guessed that already and barium strontium mixtures, so you see different parts of it, and they look to see how these sound and what happens to the gas after they drop it, because the, the currents of wind in the upper atmosphere are harder to track than the wind here on Earth. So we got pictures sent to us, fortunately, we're very lucky, and here we see uh, the astrophotographer looking off at some of these unusual, very unusual sky sites. If I saw that, I was like, what is that? And there were, they had NASA and Norway uh, and Europe had many people watching this to see what would happen to the gas canisters, how they would float. And that helps tell us how the solar wind transfers energy to the Earth, among other things. So it was more than just a pretty show. OK, I said there was another rover on Mars. There is, and it is Curiosity. And Curiosity usually looks across Mars and sees things like we saw. Um, it's uh, looking for the ancient history of Mars to see if Mars could have ever supported life, but sometimes it looks back at the sun. And sometimes when it looks back at the sun, it sees something like this. Okay, that was so cool. I'm going to do that again. That was an eclipse, but not of the whole sun. That was uh, one of the moons of uh, Mars, Deimos. Uh, crossing the sun. So it was an eclipse as seen from the surface of Mars. Phobos, I'm sorry, it was Phobos crossing the sun. Okay, this is a fuzzy image, but it is in a spectacular image. This is the first horizon scale image of a black hole. So this is, um, uh, the, the, the dark part here is called the black hole's shadow. It is not necessarily the event horizon. Uh, the event horizon, well, there's, there's gas around this black hole, and so some of the gas is in front, but because you can't see the gas behind, there's a pretty much a dark spot where most of the event horizon is. But this is the first event horizon scale image where we can see down to the event horizon. And so this was not center of our, this was the center of M87. 
And they're currently also doing this Event Horizon Telescope. People are doing this for the center of our own galaxy and others in the future. So this way we can learn a lot more about black holes and what happens with them. Okay, I've gotten a question. Have you ever had problems with authenticity in any of, any of the submissions? Great question. And the answer is yes. On some occasions, we've run images that turned out not to be what they thought. Our policy is that so long as you describe exactly what it is that's being submitted, even if it's an image conglomerate, we're good with it. Um, we're, we won't disqualify it. However, if you imply, if you lie about your image, if you imply something that's not true even strongly or don't describe, then we'll sort of disqualify it and think, well, it's not reliable. We do have a team. So we have a, a discussion board called the Asterisk. And sometimes we will post an image there and astrophotographers will tell us what they think. Uh, I have a, a former graduate student who uh, specializes in astrophotography and is really good at telling fakes. Also, Jerry and I have been around. I mean, APOT's coming on 25 years. So we've seen a few uh, images. So we usually know the fakes pretty quick. But if we don't, then some of the, um, some of the pros, so a graduate student might know, uh, some of the pros on our board will know, uh, but even so, every now and then we are fooled. Relatively rarely. Okay, in recent years, there is a, a mystery as to why there are detections of methane on Mars. So uh, recently, this past year, the mystery deepened, let me consult my notes again, sorry, uh, because the um, ESA's Roscosmos ExoMars Trace Gas, or gas Orbiter ex unexpectedly did not detect methane in the atmosphere of Mars. Well, before, both Curiosity rolling on Mars and ESA's Mars Express did within a day of each other. Now, who cares if there's methane on Mars? It's some kind of gas. We know there's methane on air. It's bubbling out of flakes. But on Mars, is an indication on any planet it would be an indication of life, but it's not the only way. Making methane is not all specifically saying there must be life, but it's an indication there might be. So it could be there are microbes under Mars making life, but there might not be. We're not sure. It's one of the big mysteries of our time. And it only deepened this past year. Okay, so this is the Cat's Eye Nebula, again from Hubble. So um, this was taken not only by Hubble, but uh, Chandra in X-ray light. And this is a planetary nebula. So our sun will do something like this when, when it's finished fusing hydrogen into helium in its core. And it's absolutely spectacularly beautiful in my opinion. Look at the detail in that. Uh, we don't know what all the detail means. There's a lot we see, we take pictures of. And professional astronomers, we don't know everything. NASA doesn't know everything, but that's what partly drives all this trying to understand. We know a lot of the gross features of this. We can explain some of the gross features. Some of the details, probably not. Okay, so this past year, we listened to Mars. SICE, uh, part of the um, Mars InSight Lander, uh, was deployed from Mars InSight Lander, is right here, and started listening to Mars. Because we don't really know what's inside Mars either. We don't know whether Mars has a liquid core or not. We can tell a lot about what's inside the Earth because there are earthquakes and it bounces around and bounces off liquid cores of the Earth than it would if it was solid. So we figure, well, let's give Mars a shot because we don't really know what's under Mars. So far, we haven't had that deep a Mars quake, so we can tell for sure. But there have been some, some quakes that we've seen, uh, that we've heard. And we've heard a lot of um, the wind blowing past, uh, past the, the, um, the spacecraft. And whenever the spacecraft is, is, uh, does something, when the arm moves or something like that, then you can sort of hear it. It's so sensitive, the seismometer, you can hear it. So we're still listening. We're hoping for deep Mars quakes and hoping to decipher the interior of Mars this way. This happened this past year. OK. There's places you can go on Earth that are really cool, as you know. Many of you have been there. This one is in southern Mexico. This is a Mayan pyramid called the Pyramid of the Feathered Serpent. And so you can go there near an equinox, and you can see, if you know exactly what to look for, a feathered serpent go down the... Now, it's not really a feathered serpent. It's a, 
it's well known what's happened. It's a bunch of shadows. It's the shadows of the blocks on the side that's visible just at the equinox, but it sure looks like there is a serpent of some kind going down the pyramid, and it is really cool. And now there's big crowds there, so get there early. And that is one of the cool things. It's sort of astro-tourism that's popular now. It's an astro-tourism thing you can do. Okay, so exoplanets. This past year, we've discovered a lot more exoplanets. So Kepler is shut down, but a new satellite, um, TESS, is measuring that. And so someone uh, put these to music. So the data came from the NASA Exoplanet Archive, but uh, uh, an astronomer who was not um, directly involved in the Exoplanet Archive put it to music, and here it is. So this is the band of our Milky Way galaxy here. This is the night sky. So there's different ways of finding exoplanets, planets outside our solar system. So it started in the early 90s. Recently, a Nobel Prize was given for the first planets. And these are the different methods by the color. How fast the planet goes around, the faster it goes around, the higher the pitch. There's distortions, visual distortions near the edges. And as time goes on, as the years go on, we discover more and more of these. And with tests, we're discovering even more. We're looking around sun-like stars. So we're trying to find other Earths and other life. And this is a step in that direction. So this big block was Kepler in here. So we went over 4,000 in 2019, a good year for exoplanets. Okay, again, here's a spotless sun and here is a space station. We get a lot of these images. These have to be really carefully timed, as many of you will know. So this one was really popular. Uh, we thought it would be. We have our focus groups and they really responded to this one. So it's usually you see other sunspots, you're not sure what this sunspot is. This sunspot, which I guess looks like a high fighter from Star Wars, um, is really just a space station. Okay, so Apollo 11 uh, launched to the moon this past year. And um, so here is uh, a launch. Actually, we're running low on time and I want to get to the next one. So why don't we jump over that one, a rocket launch, and go right to Descent to the Moon, which was 50th anniversary of one of the biggest milestones in humanity. And I'm gonna to jump to 1426 about. Close to landing, altitude 42. So at this point, Apollo 11 is headed down and they've just been cleared for landing, go for landing, which is amazing. No spacecraft has ever been allowed been down to go for landing before. Apollo 10 got close, but it wasn't supposed to, didn't go down. So they're going down now. There's um, Michael Collins is circling the moon, but he's not in the Eagle, which is headed toward the surface. That's Aldrin and, I'm, and Armstrong, as I'm sure all of you know. So this, was, this whole display was put together by someone from Great Britain. It takes a lot of different feeds. This is the picture out the window. Here's an altitude meter. Here's the pitch of the spacecraft. Here's, some, here's the, um, what people are saying um, in caption. So they are headed down to the moon. Aldrin's calling out numbers. Here in program 66, Armstrong takes control of the lunar module. So he's landing it himself now. There is a computer that was supposed to do more of it, but Armstrong saw there was a boulder field down there and he wanted to take control of himself. And he's very experienced at this. It started to get exciting though. So P66 here says Armstrong's in control. Aldrin's calling out numbers to help Armstrong out. This is what they're seeing. Well, there's two different windows. This is one of the windows. Armstrong is looking for a place to put down the lunar module. It wasn't supposed to be this exciting. 
Now the problem with landing near West Crater is you can't put, land lunar module on too much of a tilt or else it can't take off or it might fall over. So you have to find a flat area that doesn't have boulders. And that's what Armstrong was looking for. He's looking. Okay, they put up something called the bingo call. When the bingo call gets towards zero, you have to decide. You're going back because you're not going to land on the moon, or you're landing right then because you're running out of fuel. You have almost no fuel left. So you, have, you can't let the bingo call get to zero. And Armstrong is trying to land it with a minute 14 seconds left on the bingo call. Time to the bingo call. Aldrin's calling out numbers. Seventy-five feet. Looking good. Down a half. Sixty. Sixty seconds. Sixty seconds to bingo. Sixty seconds. Right on. Down two and a half. Mission control is just watching. Forward. Forward. A little bit worried. Forty feet down two and a half. People on Earth can hear the audio feed. Thirty feet two and a half down. Make that out. Four forward, four forward, drift into the right. Thirty line. seconds 30, to bingo call. Thirty seconds. Thirty seconds. Thirty seconds. Twenty seconds. On back right. Okay, engine stop. APA at a deep end. Boat control, boat auto. Deep You've heard Aldrin a lot. Right Here comes Armstrong. Engine arm off. Four thirteen is in. We copy you down, Eagle. Okay, everybody, T1, stand by for T1. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. And they made it. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. And humans were on the moon. And this is the panorama that they can see out the window. You're looking good here. So I'm going to skip over this. Okay, we're going to be busy for Running late. Okay, so this past year, by measuring where galaxies are in the universe, we confirmed that there's this, we're on the edge of a, Milky Way galaxy is on the edge of a huge local void. So there's the Virgo cluster, cluster galaxies, the Coma cluster galaxies, something called the Great Attractor. These are all um, contours where there's lots of galaxies, but near us, there's relatively little. We're just on the edge of a local void. and That became more clear this past year. So Pluto was taking a lot of pictures from um, New Horizons, uh, but the Pluto is actually multicolored, and to get the colors just right took a lot of processing. So over this past year, um, a, a version of Pluto in true color uh, came out. Okay, I have a question. Will we find an Earth-like exoplanet planet before we destroy ours? Um, I sure hope so. I think so. So here's another uh, attempt to uh, find um, or an Earth-like planet. This is a planet that was an exoplanet seen out in the universe that actually had water vapor on it. So the way we can tell it had water vapor is because it went in front of its parent star and the parent starlight went through the atmosphere of the exoplanet and we can see what light is absorbed and some of the light that's absorbed was, is, was, must have been absorbed by water vapor. And so we know now for sure, we've always guessed there was, there are planets out there that orbit sun-like stars and have water vapor in their atmospheres. So we know we have a lot of water vapor in our atmosphere. We see them as clouds. Actually, Mars does too, but we don't know if there's life on Mars. So it's an indicator there could be life out there, but it's not a sure thing. Okay, here's a really cool image of uh, Sprite lightning, a different kind of lightning that wasn't all that well known before. Um, it's above thunderstorms. It goes up, not down. Extremely detailed images. Let's skip over that a bit. So we're coming to an era where there's lots of satellites going in front of stuff. So a lot of astrophotographers, of which many might be listening now, are getting planes and satellites going in front of them. And so this is a picture of the Andromeda galaxy before any photoshopping was done. Uh, and so you can see lots of the, lane, the plane and satellite lines, but then if I click once, they can go away. So it wasn't actually Photoshop itself, the specific software took it away. It was, um, image processing techniques on uh, different images of Andromeda and minimizing the, the lines that took them away. So we can still do astronomy, it's just harder. And with the new Starlink 
satellites and others coming up with the future communi future communication satellite constellations, this will get even harder, it seems, to do, but it won't be impossible. So here's an image of the second interstellar object that we know of that came into our solar system. This is a comet, and it looks like a pretty normal comet, and it's comet uh, Borisov, and uh, it's just right now the nearest it will be to the sun. It was discovered last year. Uh, last year was the first all-female spacewalk. Uh, we had Jessica Meyer and Christina Koch on the space station on duty when they needed to go out and swap out a component, and so they did. And of course it went fine, and here we see them both uh, working hard to swap out that component. So the next one will be the, uh, oh no, Mercury Cross the Sun. So we had a Mercury Crossing, so I'll run this. Actually, I, it's, uh, I don't like the sound on this one, so we'll just run it quietly, I'll talk over it. So it's hard to see, and it's not jumpy as it seems, but right here is the planet Mercury, which just, um, just within the month, uh, crossed the sun and actually crossed the center of the sun. So Mercury uh, does that more often than Venus, but uh, again, there's no sunspots on the sun, so it's um, a very quiet sun, and so it was unusual to see, and Mercury stood out. Uh, so this is, uh, by some measures, the most popular image that we, we ran on APOD this past year. It was an aurora that looked like a dragon. So the astrophotographer told his mom, and his mom ran outside and just looked up and said, wow. And so we post it because it really does look like a dragon. And it was really popular. So many times when there are nebula or aurora that look like common things, it's a mixture of the, sort of the real and the surreal. And when you get that together, it's very popular. People like that because there's something they can understand and something that they can't understand all mixed together. So it becomes like a logical thing to gawk at and a stepping stone to a greater understanding. So with that, I will say that's the end of my formal presentation. Please join the Night Sky Network if you're not already. If so, you can find an astronomy club or an event near you. And here is uh, an address. And uh, we do have a milestone for APOD. We've got our 25th anniversary coming up in June 2020. So if there's more time, I will take some questions. Uh, if you have to go right on the hour, uh, thanks for attending. And uh, so I'll uh, leave you with that, but I will actually, I, there is a, a backup one. There's one more. So that was the whole show. But here's like a bonus, so like an encore. Uh, someone did this for us. Uh, they now record, uh, so this is the APOD read aloud by oh, artificial intelligence. Picture of the day, October 14, 2019. So you can just run this Today's in the background. So this is the image I already showed you. So this artificial intelligence will automatically read this aloud. And as it says here, no humans were involved in making this. So now we have whole months that are just completely automated and you can see one play after the next. And you can have that running in a science center, in your community center, in your university, at home. Uh, you can just have one play after the next and you can just stand and watch for a bit and then go away and come back and they'll just keep playing. So someone did that for us and we we're proud of it, so I thought I'd point that out. So thanks again, and uh, I'm happy to take your questions. All right. Well, we've got one more question that came in. They said, is it uh, best to submit images by email or some other method? And I think that Dave um, put up the uh, link for the submission page there. So you know, how does that work? Is it a, a purely online? Well, um, yeah. So. The best is on the submission page to send email that goes to both, uh, both the APOD people, Jerry Bennell and me, and that's the best way. But there are other ways. Uh, we have our discussion board, the asterisk, and you can post your image in the, the image section of the, uh, the asterisk. And we also have a, um, a Flickr page that we look at. Um, and people can upload their images to the Flickr page. But, uh, the best way, and I look at all the image submissions, I know there's more than 20 a day now, but I look at them all. And uh, so if you want to make sure that we both see it, both Jerry and I see it, send it to both email addresses and you'll get our consideration. Okay, so they to get a file for printing a 2020 calendar. Yes, so someone is working on that. Uh, there's a preliminary version already, and in the next few days, we will be making that, that link 
to the 2020 calendar uh, PDF available. So thank you. I know David Ingram, thanks for asking. I know that's been a really popular thing with a lot of people to uh, be able to have that. So. Yes, we get a lot of downloads for our calendar. Thousands. Well, we are at the very top of the hour, and so uh, maybe you should uh, stop sharing your screen now. And um, so let's uh, call this the last question. We have it from Ara. Um, any plans to fix the APOD website on Chrome? And I don't know of any difficulties, but maybe you do. Oh, wow, okay. So we have a bunch of people who are really well informed, okay. So uh, to our surprise, there's a, we have this page called the Archive Picks page that lists every single astronomy picture of the day going back to 1995. So there's several thousand, more than 5,000 uh, images linked there. So I find that myself useful because I remember a title or something like that and I go search on that. However, uh, the most recent Chrome browser does something that we didn't expect. It does something called prefetching. So what prefetching is, is it goes and takes all those links and on the, there's a link to every single iPod there and it fetches them all, prefetches them. So if you want to see one, they're already fetched for you and you can just, it just brings it up really fast. So that's great. But the problem is, since we have so many links, it saturates a lot of browsers and the browser can't handle it, it doesn't have that much memory. So we've already have a fix in that we tried to run it for a few days where we only have the archive page go back to 2015 and of all the images since 2015. So that will be coming more, then we noticed there was an error in that page, so we're fixing that. But it will be fixed. So yes, thanks for the question. It will be fixed, it's already being fixed. We're aware of the issue and we're doing the best we can. We did not expect that there would be, a uh, Chrome browser is the only one I think that shows this. We're also, I was holding out, I was the one that's holding out saying, look, Chrome's gonna fix their browser. We're gonna go to a lot of trouble and then they're just gonna fix it and it's gonna go away. But so far that hasn't been done. Good question. Of course, uh, my answer would be uh, use Firefox instead. So it's. Uh, but yes, I'm working on the Mac. <laughs> Safari doesn't have the problem. My yeah. Spark doesn't. All right. Well, thank you so much, Robert. This is absolutely wonderful. Thank you for joining us this evening. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. You'll be able to find this uh, um, webinar along with many others on the NASA Night Sky Network YouTube page, as well as the Night Sky Network website. And so you'll be able to find that within the next couple of days.